Coming up on Nebraska Stories, life after The Voice for singer Josh Hoyer. Husker volleyball players give back. The famous Nebraska artist you've never heard of. A look back at Carney's surprising role during World War II and seeing the world through a different lens. has always been something that turned me on. I just want to make sure that it's that it's always something that I enjoy and something that's that's pure and that, that I'm I'm loving. It's what I love to do and uh, it's been okay as a career so I'm gonna continue to do that until until the day comes where maybe I don't feel that way but right now I'm in it. We've had 150 to 175 shows a year uh, for the last five years. And it stayed really busy and a lot of that's on the road. And so the people that you're with, I mean, you, you've got to have a certain level of love and a certain level of trust and uh, a real understanding of what the partnership is. I took a two step forward and then I took a step back. When we roll into towns and different uh, states and different countries, uh, knowing that we're from Nebraska, sometimes it's People are a little surprised that, that we can do the things that we do and play the music that we do with um, the soul and, and funk and old school R&B. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to go out and surprise folks that there's different stuff happening in Nebraska. I'm gonna show you something right now. Obviously, I understand the history of the music that I'm playing and uh, hold it in a very dear regard and uh, respect where it came from. But at the same time, I think when you tap into that emotion, and that, that vibe, that, that uh, yeah, color and, and, and race and, uh, you know, creed, it all goes away. One of my new friends that I met recently in South Carolina said it's all the truth. So once you get to that point, uh, I don't think it really matters. Honoring the music, continuing some kind of tradition, it says something about uh, the power of, of soul and R&B. If you can tap into it, that, that, that energy is there and it, it will remain there. It's not a dying history. I had the chance to be on the on the Voice, the TV show, and you know I've I've got a certain number of people that think that it's kind of an automatic uh, open door to to a great amount of success, and that's it's not true. The reality is that there's a lot of great great artists out there. There's a lot of hard work to get from point A to point B. You have to be pretty willing to deal with with a lot of uh, difficulties to to continue down that path. And it ages you quick, too. My goodness. <laughs> and that's a song that I wrote about kind of the situation that we're in here, particularly now, uh, with everybody so divided. In my travels and in my experience in life, I've realized that, that we're all pretty similar. Um, even if you, you know, depending on whatever side of the aisle you're on or whatever your religious beliefs are or whatever uh, race or culture you're from, you know, in the end, we all want the same things. And that's to, to be able to take care of our families and have love in our life and to have food and water and shelter and just, you know, live a, a decent and good life. I don't know, that's what the tune's about is. You know, get off your high horse and let's, let's talk a little bit about what our differences are and uh, 
try to figure something out that works out for everybody. Here we went to Nicaragua and we worked on classrooms through an organization called Seeds of Learning. And we were working with the community um, and helping add on classrooms to their school. There was 564 kids cramming into three classrooms and so we went there and tried to add on to their school building. You expect them to be sad and dreary because they don't have all the things that we have when like 
they're just so genuinely happy. Tell them how old you are. I don't know, it's just life changing, you know, seeing how some people live and just how innovative they are and how they use certain things just to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's really cool. The biggest thing that I've discovered in watching and talking with them is how much those kids in those countries appreciate Americans coming down there. <laughs> Planning was cool. Um, the guides were really awesome. They'd let us like go upside down and super woman. That's cool. I've never done that before. You would be going down the zip line and you would just see a monkey just hanging out in the tree. So that was kind of cool. It's like some things you learn over there you can use towards your sport. Maybe it's an attitude or maybe it's showing more gratitude every day. I think they just brought back being really grateful for everything that we have and it's really cool to have girls who are volunteering and doing something like that. It's not just a one day, couple hour thing. It's like a full week investment. So um, I think it's awesome that our girls are doing that and they're really invested in that, but they have brought back so much and just taught us some really good lessons from that. And Brianna and Sydney go in there and give to those kids. They probably get back more in return than what they're giving. And uh, so as part of our saying at Brass of Volleyball, you gotta give to get. And a lot of times when you give, you're gonna get way more back. He's considered by some to be one of America's best artists, and perhaps the greatest artist ever to represent Nebraska. In the 1930s and 40s, painter Dale Nichols was at the height of his fame. He was a painter in the vein of Grant Wood or Thomas Hart Benton, best known for depicting rural scenes like the kind he saw growing up just outside David City. All of his artwork is about David City and his experience growing up here and his memory of it. People would say about Dale Nichols that uh, he put Nebraska on the map. He always said no, Nebraska put him on the map. His imagery was uh, of Nebraska and of Nebraska farmsteads and farms. And that's why he was able to make a living as an artist. So he always gave credit to Nebraska for that. The artist died in 1995 but his work can be seen at the Bone Creek Museum of Agrarian Art in David City, featuring 40 years of paintings that include his most well-known masterpieces, as well as works that go beyond his typical farm scenes. His first paintings were the, what we call Red Barn Americana paintings, and they were very popular, and they sold very, very well. His first painting to go in a major museum was purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in 1939, and it hung next to a Picasso. But Nichols kept experimenting and looking and testing himself. Each painting is a unique invention. That is remarkable. Nichols left Nebraska soon after high school to pursue a career in art. He knew from a very young age that art was what he really loved to do. Growing up on, on the farm, he had to help with chores. But any chance he got, I can picture him laying out in the fields and looking up at the sky and putting together scenes that he might like to draw. Associate Curator Amanda Gunther spent a lot of time picturing Dale Nichols at work. She's just completed a book about the artist. It's the first book to explore the life and work of Dale Nichols. He was extremely creative, driven, passionate about his work. Amanda learned about the artist's perspective by examining years of personal correspondence he had with his niece, Ruth Nichols. This particular little note right here in this letter says, just put a little light around it. In her late 20s, Ruth realized she had a passion for art as well. She contacted her famous uncle, and they began a friendship through letters. 
There were so many people that didn't like him, but didn't really know him, even his own family. Didn't understand him. I learned to understand him more and accept him. And Dale took a special interest in Ruth, sharing with her his advice, teachings, and philosophies about doing great art. He sent me lessons I never knew what I was going to get. This was especially exciting to get. He was showing me how to plan a subject and then how to incorporate the color and the light. Dale sent her detailed guidelines for how to paint, and Ruth saved every letter, every diagram, even harsh critiques from her uncle about her own work. He told me he was determined to make an artist out of me. He was determined I would paint like him because when he was gone, I'm all he had left. And that was a huge chart that scared me to death because I knew I could never be like him. And I knew how important it was for him to leave somebody his legacy of some sort. You know, I just, I love art, I love to paint, um, but I'm not Dale. time of war in the heart of Nebraska. Soldiers and citizens came together at the Kearney Army Airfield. The whole area here was mobilized to support the base. Kearney goes to war. Kearney was a, a processing base. What processing amounted to, it processed both airplanes and the men. The airplanes came here straight from the factory. Some of them needed modifications before they went overseas. You had several different uh, variants of each airplane over time, and there, so there were a lot of, of maintenance issues that had to be done. Lower octane fuel had been drained out of the airplanes. They had 100 octane in when they left. Uh, the guns were loaded and mounted, and the whole airplane got a real thorough check before they sent it off, because once they left here, they were going straight in combat. They'd make these 20-year-old guys sign for uh the airplane, like they were going to be charged for it at the, <laughs> if they didn't bring it back or if they got it scratched. And uh, I've had a local farmer uh, tell me about it. Just scared him to death to have to sign, personally sign for that aircraft. They were all fresh out of training. Next step is combat. So they had a number of things they needed to do. Uh, they might write wills. They might buy life insurance. They might uh, get their teeth fixed, get their shots. And another thing that was important that happened during processing was that the people at Carney that were doing the processing would try to weed out the incompetents who had somehow gotten through the training and gotten to that point, at which time they were yanked out of the Air Forces and put into the infantry. It was an important base. Uh, the rest of the, of the air bases in Nebraska were all operated under Carney as the main base, with the exception of, of the one in, in Omaha. But the other thing that should be remembered is the contribution that the civilians made. The whole area here was mobilized, uh, and they came in from quite a ways away to support the base here. Ladies come in from the farm and pack parachutes, for example. There was a, a WAC mechanics group here where they were uh, working on the engines. And just all aspects of the base life, they were civilian and military workers. And this was true all over the country. Everybody wanted to do their bit. And so there was no shortage of people that were trying to help. And had we not had the cooperation of the civilians for that war, uh, would we still have won it? Most likely. But it would have taken a lot longer. And we'd have had to have had a military that was three or four times the size because, because of all the contributions that the civilians made. So the basic Kearney, in many ways, is a microcosm of what went on across the country as far as people having an opportunity to to really contribute to the war effort. Shacks that they had put up out there for us to live in was about next to nothing. Then they, then they had the guts to feed us with that food out there. Every other spoonful was sand. 
Thousands of soldiers had left the comforts of home behind, and it was up to the citizens of Kearney to provide them with hospitality. Many of the families kind of uh, adopted these young fellows and invited them into their homes for home-cooked meals and picnics and other things. Among the ways the Kearney soldiers stayed entertained, the most popular were easily the dances. Dances were an almost nightly event with big name acts regularly coming to the base or to clubs in the surrounding area. We had Harry James and we had uh, Tommy Dorsey and then they had big name bands come in there because they were going across country and they'd make that stop and have a, uh, pick up a few dollars and then keep on going. So. The biggest problem had to do with turning a couple of thousand testosterone-laden young men loose in the community. And the uh, parents were justifiably worried about what, what could result. They formed what was called the Hostess Club. And to be a member of the Hostess Club, you had to be at least 18 and single and of good moral standing. It was organized along military lines. They had captains and colonels, and, and the captains and the colonels consisted of older women from Kearney who served as chaperones. This pretty much laid everyone's fears, and it worked very well throughout the war. It wasn't until the tail end of the war that it kind of fell apart, and that was because there were so many young women that were attending the dances at the air base that the whole chaperone thing just kind of disintegrated. Another result of the boosted population, the presence of black soldiers, meant Kearney had to begin enforcing the racial segregation practices common at the time. This included separate facilities for blacks and whites. The thing you have to remember about it is that a white soldier could go into any tavern in town and buy a beer, but that wasn't possible for the blacks, so they got right to work on building a black servicemen's club. The spot that they chose for it happened to be right across the street from the Methodist Church. And at that time, there was a very active dry movement in Nebraska, and most of the clergy in Kearney objected strongly to the fact that this was going to be right across the street from the church. But what ultimately happened was that the commanding officer put his foot down, and he said, you have to find a place for where these guys can congregate and, and drink beer. And if you don't, then we're going to restrict everybody to base and not allow any of the troops into town. Well, these guys were real free spenders and certainly the city council didn't want to see him restricted to base. So right away there was another meeting held and they promptly approved the location on, on Avenue A. And they announced that the beer would be free until such time as they obtained a liquor license. Especially for the airmen that were passing through. It was the last real impression of America that they got before they left. Because again, when they left here, they went straight overseas. They didn't sit in Maine for two weeks waiting to go. People in the community went out of their way to try to make them feel welcome. Growing up, I really did have a normal childhood. I guess you could say I really didn't realize that I was any different than anybody else. So, yeah, my childhood was just as normal as anybody else's. But not everyone grows up with spina bifida. Spina bifida is a hole in your spine when you're born with a hole in your spine. The skin doesn't close all the way around your spine when you're in the womb. And um, sometimes, depending on the severity, it can eat away at different muscles or um, nerves and things like that, so. Naya Carmen started taking photos when she was just nine years old. At first, it was just a hobby, but it turned into something more. I had amazing mentors along the way who got me started and just kind of helped my talent grow and found out that I was pretty good at it. For Naya, 
Photography is both an art and a profession, depending on the assignment. She shoots everything from landscapes, wildlife, and portraits to professional jobs like this one. Today, she is focusing her artistic skills on the tools of the firefighting trade. And then, you know, later on, if you, you want to get up in there with the camera and there's, and there's interesting things that you want pictures of, we can, we can do that too. Okay. The planning going into a shoot is a lot more complex, I think, for myself than it is for most able-bodied photographers. Um, my brain and my body working against one another, like I'll have something in my mind or, you know, somewhere where I want to get and it might not be as accessible as I'd like it to be or terrain obviously is one that I have to think about and where I'm shooting and what I'm going to do and the positions that I have to be in. Weather is a huge factor sometimes too. Yeah, there's a lot of planning and thinking and that goes along with it. No, I know that, but the jacket needs to be out of the door more. Yeah. For right now, my mother happens to be my assistant on my photo shoots. She um, helps me carry my equipment and get the lenses and everything in my tripod and the lights and stuff where they need to be and helps me, you know, to go through and navigate where I'm at. So, yeah, she's my assistant. She's the one who maneuvers where she wants to get, but... I'm there in case, <laughs> in case of an accident. I do think my view is a lot different than most photographers because not only being so short, <laughs> but being on a different level as far as like sometimes I'm sitting and sometimes I'm on my crutches and those kind of things. And I just they see things I think differently than most people because I see it at a lower viewpoint than most. She inspires me every day. I don't know if I had to do the things that she does and work at it as hard as she does if I would do it. I really don't. So the really cool thing is, is at least my artwork speaks for itself at first. And then if they show a real true genuine interest, then the secondary part comes along where then my story plays into it. Being an individual, you know, that is also a photographer who just happens to have spine bifida, so. To see more Nebraska Stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund. <laughs>